Okay. Good morning. And welcome to this TDL webinar on Open Journal Systems version 3, during which we'll provide an overview of new features and plans for upgrades of TDL hosted journals. My name is Christy Park. I'm the director of the Texas Digital Library, and also I serve as the service manager for our OJS hosting service. TDL is ready, finally, to begin upgrading our hosted journals to the latest version of Open Journal Systems. And uh, this has been a long time coming. I know many of you have been anxious for this to happen, and we are excited to get the process started and believe it will be a, a great improvement for many of our journal teams. Before we get started, I have a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, if you have questions at any time during the presentation today, please feel free to enter those into the chat pod on the left-hand side of this, the screen here in Adobe Connect. I'll answer those as I ha have an appropriate moment, and we'll also have a Q&A session at the end. We should have plenty of time for Q&A. Leah DeForest, our communication strategist, is here in the meeting with me and will be monitoring that chat window and help catch all of those questions. Additionally, we are recording this webinar and we'll post it on our YouTube channel after it has been captioned. And we'll also share out the slides and notes with those of you who registered for the presentation. If you want to download the slides in PDF form, they're available here in the Adobe Connect meeting for you in that downloads pod in the bottom left hand uh, portion of the screen. So you can just go ahead and, and download them now. Okay. We have uh, quite a bit of ground to cover today and I want to leave a lot of time for Q&A. So I'm going to start with a very very brief overview of Texas Digital Library and our OJS hosting service for those of you not familiar with us. And then we'll head into an overview of some, though not nearly all, of the new features coming with OJS version 3. Next, I'll spend some time going over the upgrade process for TDL hosted journals so that you know what to expect in that process. And finally, I'll share some links to resources we have available for you to continue learning and exploring as you prepare for this upgrade. We'll hopefully and surely have time for Q&A at the end. The Texas Digital Library is a consortium of higher education institutions that, according to our mission statement here, builds capacity for preserving, managing, and providing access to unique digital collections of enduring value. As part of our mission to support the research efforts at our member institutions, as well as increase access to the results of research, the TDL hosts academic journals using the Open Journal Systems platform, and currently 13 of our 24 members use this service. OJS, or Open Journal Systems, as you all are very likely aware, is an open source solution to managing and publishing scholarly journals online. It's been designed to reduce the time and energy devoted to the clerical and managerial tasks associated with editing a journal, while improving the record keeping and efficiency of editorial processes. It covers all aspects of online publishing, from establishing a journal website to um, the author submission process, peer review, editing, publication, archiving, and indexing of the journal's content. And it helps manage the people aspects of managing a journal, like keeping track of the work of editors, reviewers, and authors, communicating with readers, and assisting with all the correspondence asso associated with those tasks. Many thousands of journals worldwide use this platform, and TDL hosts it for our member institutions. OJS is a product of the Public Knowledge Project, which is a nonprofit research education and software development project from Stanford and Simon Fraser Universities. And our hosting service is, of course, deeply indebted to the work of the PKP community. 
And I want to acknowledge here at the beginning, too, that this presentation relies heavily on the excellent and extensive documentation that the PKP community has created and which it has licensed under a Creative Commons license to facilitate reuse and adaptation. And I have a link on this slide here to um, a portion of that documentation which we have used in creating our own materials, including this webinar. TDL hosts about 75 journals through partnerships with our member institutions, and it's important to keep in mind that any hosted journal is a collaboration among multiple parties. TDL provides hosting and technical support for the journals, while the journal's editorial team undertakes the work of policy setting, workflow decision making, and editorial workflow management. Our member institutions provide another important layer of support, and I have a and libraries on this slide, but that could be any of our member institutions who um, uh, sponsor journals through this service. Um, those folks serve as liaisons between TDL and the editorial team, and in many cases provide value-added services like consultation, um, help with uh, registering DOIs, uh, any number of other things. If any journal teams on the line today don't know who their journal liaison is at your institution, please get in touch with us um, through our help desk at support.tdl.org, and we'll get you in contact with them. Those um, library faculty and library staff who are supporting journals um, locally at your institution are a really important part of your support team. Okay, so we're going to head into the, the meat of this webinar now, but before we do, I want to um, lay some groundwork for these upgrades and what they entail. OJS is a, 3 is a major release with some big changes to both the reader and administrative interface. Um, so it'll take some getting used to, um, but overall I would say it, it represents a major improvement over the last version, and I think many of you are aware of that and anxious to, to get going with it. Because of the major changes to the interface, however, um, any theming customizations you may have done to your OJS2 journal will not carry over to the upgrade site. This is something, the upgraded site, excuse me. This is something that we're going to talk about more as we go through the rest of um, the content in this webinar, but I want to note it up front and you'll be reminded of it periodically, that any customizations you've made are not going to make it into OJS3. And that's, when I talk about customizations, I'm talking about CSS theming customizations. Secondly, TDL will upgrade journals in batches by institution. So we're starting with the University of Houston and Texas State University sponsored journals, and the next batch of journals after that will be Texas A&M libraries, and then we'll go from there. Um, we hope that we can accelerate the pace of upgrades as we go, but our goal overall is to have them all done by April. We hope we'll be done well before then, but realistically, we feel we need to spread these 75 journal site upgrades over several months so that we can adequately support each journal team and allow our staff to maintain progress on some other projects. Each journal team will have multiple opportunities to test, learn, and theme their journal in OJS3. And we'll keep a flexible schedule. You will tell us when you're ready to take the final step because we want you and your journal to be well prepared for this change. So all of these points I'll be expanding on throughout the, the rest of the presentation, but I wanted to kind of lay these uh, points out up front. And with that, we will head into looking at what's new in OJS3. As I mentioned, OJS3 is significantly different from its predecessor. Um, the changes include reader interface improvements like easier navigation and simplified registration, editorial 
interface changes that increase efficiency and add new functionality. And it also includes a fully responsive design that in many ways is more easily customizable than OJS2 was. I'm going to start by going through some specific features starting with the, the reader interface. So by default, um, OJS3 is installed with a very simple functional user interface. Um, the screenshot here is of our demo journal, which is in the default theme. And you know, there, I've made a couple of little tweaks with a homepage image and changing the colors. So this interface includes a top header, navigation blocks to the right, and a main content block in the middle of the page. You can see from the screenshot that the user functions now exist as part of your profile menu at the top right of the screen. Things like the editorial dashboard, profile information, these things um, are moved away from the general user view and it makes for a much cleaner overall reader interface. Sidebar information is clearly broken out there on the right hand side of the screen and then you have your top navigation bar which has collapsible menus for the about functions like policy statements, submission instructions, and contact info. Any custom navigation links are included in this collapsible menu as well. Okay. Here you can see a page with a journal issue. And like OJS2, each article has a linked title for viewing object metadata and abstracts. And galleys are now clearly labeled below the titles with clearer, logo, clearer logos. To ease registration for new users, OJS3 has prioritized a small set of required fields on a single screen. So a new user just has to fill out their name, affiliation, email, and um, create a username and password, and then they can register. After that, they can go back and fill out that long list of um, optional fields if they choose to. But um, they can get through the registration process much quicker. We'll move behind the scenes now and uh, look at the editorial interface dashboard, which consists of the following elements. We have the top navigation bar, that dark blue bar at the top, um, which lists the journal that you're currently working in, in this case, the OJS3 demo journal. Next to that are your tasks, which are items needing immediate attention. And across to the right-hand side of the screen, you have um, the language, which you can toggle into different languages if your journal is supporting, um, uh, if your journal is multilingual. You can view the reader interface and log out. Along the left-hand side of the screen, you have the left menu panel, which we're going to drill down into a little bit more. These are the major sections of the dashboard, including the submissions, issue management, settings, user and role management, and tools. And we're going to look at this more closely, but just overall, I want you to kind of get a sense of how this looks different from um, the OJS2 uh, administrative interface or editorial interface. So what appears here in the left menu panel is different depending on what permissions you have. In this journal, in this screenshot, uh, I'm logged in as both a journal manager and editor. So I have both of those roles and these are the links that appear for me in the left menu panel. Users with fewer permissions, like an author, say, would see fewer links here. This solves a, a, what was, I think, a common annoyance with OJS2, which was the need to switch roles to do different tasks in the journal website. So, and maybe you can relate to this. If you were a user enrolled as both a journal manager and an editor, you had access to both the submissions and the journal settings, but 
if you were in the middle of editing a submission but you realized you needed to tweak a setting on the website, you had to go all the way back to your user homepage, select your role as journal manager, go to the journal manager settings and, and change what you need to change and then go back to the user home, uh, go into the editor settings and go back into the submission. So what OJS3 has fixed is uh, you don't need to do that switching back and forth anymore. If you're logged in with, with, as a user with permission to access both submissions and journal settings, you no longer need to make that switch. The settings are just available in the left sidebar for you. So this is one of, to me, the, the biggest improvements to the user interface. As you move over each item in the left menu bar, submenus will expand, and I think you'll find that most items are where you'd expect them to be based on your experience with OJS2, but there are some things moved around and some new sections, so this is an area where you're, where you're going to want to explore and learn more about where different settings and, um, and uh, tasks reside in the interface. There's no journal setup section, for instance, if you're familiar with that, like there is in OJS2. Instead, those settings are spread out throughout these other menu sections, so you may have to dig around a bit for them. Many of those journal setup tasks are in the settings section of the dashboard. This is where you would set the journal name, ISBN number, um, etc., and where all the theming settings are under, the, under website settings. If you're looking for plugins, the plugins are in this part of the interface as well. There are a lot of things to explore in the journal settings, and I don't have time today to, to mention them all, and I, I would hazard to say that I don't know them all yet. I'm still learning too. But I do want to highlight some changes in the copyright and licensing options that I'm uh, excited about and interested in. Your copyright notice, which you have in OJS2, is now in this new section of the settings called distribution settings. But in addition to allowing you to publish a copyright notice, OJS3 also allows you to communicate an author's self-archiving policy, as well as designate the article's copyright holder, whether your uh, journal allows the author to remain, retain copyright or the journal takes copyright, and it allows you to assign a Creative Commons license of your choice to published articles um, through a nice drop-down menu here. You can see how this copyright information looks when attached to any published article in the journal. Um, this is the, kind of the landing page here of a journal article. If you scroll down to the bottom of this landing page, you'll see uh, how this copyright information looks. Um, and you can see the copyright notice and the CC license nicely displayed with it. So we hope um, our journals will take advantage of this new feature to, and, and encourage you to look into Creative Commons licensing uh, to facilitate reuse and distribution of articles in your journal. Okay, next we'll talk about some new features related to editorial workflow, starting with editorial discussion boards. To help track the communications that are a critical part of a submissions workflow, OJS3 has a new internal discussion feature for each editorial stage, um, those stages being submission, review, copy editing, and production. Discuss discussions work very much like any online forum. A user creates a discussion topic can invite others to participate and send a message. OJS3 also provides more flexible workflow options, which I think will be appealing to many folks. Um, in OJS3, you have the four editorial stages that I mentioned before, and you can see them across the top of this screenshot, submission, review, copy editing, and production. This is a little different from OJS2, which had copy editing, proofreading, and galley creation all in the same final step. 
um, OJS3 breaks out copy editing as a separate step from those production activities, but it's pretty similar otherwise. To increase editorial flexibility in OJS3, you can easily move a submission from one stage to another without completing any of the possible tasks on that stage. And that, so that means when a new submission comes in, as you can see here on the submission tab, you can send it to the next step, which is peer review, but you can also skip that entirely and accept it outright and skip peer review, or you can decline it. And the same holds true at every step. So here in the copy editing stage, if you don't do copy editing or um, for whatever reason you are skipping that process um, for any given article, you can just click that send to production but it, button and it will go directly into the, the last stage of the process. In addition to making the workflow more flexible, you can now easily change the names of existing roles. Um, and um, customize permissions for any role that's in the system. So here you have a screenshot showing the users and roles section of the dashboard. It lists all the roles in the journal and lets you customize permission levels for each role by checking or unchecking the boxes under different parts of the editorial process. You can also change the names of these roles. So if you'd rather have production managers, um, instead of journal managers, you can simply rename that role by clicking edit under the role name. And if you want to create a new role, you can do that too. OJS3 lets you make up any role you wish and associate it with any or all stages of the workflow. Next, we're going to talk about uh, themes and theming, and then we'll um, move on into talking about the upgrade process. So your OJS3 journal will come with two themes pre-installed, the default theme and the classic theme, both of which are, are shown here. The default theme on the left in OJS3 allows you to quickly select alternative font combinations and header color choices, as well as upload a header logo or a home page image. And it also has the same ability to create custom sidebar blocks, navigation links, um, and issue cover art that, that exists in OJS2. The classic theme on the right um, features a, a block-based layout for an issues table of contents with which makes great use of larger screens, but it also collapses into a clean, accessible view for smaller screens. Um, there is additional documentation about both these themes at the links on this slide if you want to learn more. Those come pre-installed with the um, journal. There are some additional themes that are available and which we're evaluating currently. Um, one of them is called the Immersion Theme, which features a full width header image. Um, that theme is depicted here, although it, it, it looks better on a computer screen, I think, than it does in this screenshot. Um, it is available in our demo journal, which I'll tell you about in a little bit, so you can test it out. And we can install it upon request in your journal, but it won't be there automatically um, when we do the upgrade, you'd have to requ request it. As before with, OJ, with all of our hosted journals, experienced web developers may upload a style sheet through the user interface to further customize any of the themes provided. Um, and this is just a screenshot of that section of the website settings where you can upload a journal style sheet. In OJS2, creating a new theme was often a challenge due to extensive, uh, the extensive number of style sheets that had to be modified. But with OJS3, they've reduced that burden by separating the style sheets and underlying templates for the admin interface and the reader interface. And so, users who um, 
want to do CSS customizations have fewer templates that they have to uh, modify in order to get a new fancy reader interface. Um, so that's good news. I will note as a reminder that TDL does not itself does not provide CSS customization support. We simply don't have the staff to, to take that on, but the website, the application itself does facilitate um, that kind of modification. If you have access to expertise on your journal team or within your library to support that. Um, and I've noted again on this slide that if you made CSS customizations in your OJS2 journal, those are not going to transfer in the upgrade just because of the nature and the um, degree of change between the interfaces between OJS2 and 3. So you're going to have to think about the look and feel of your new journal during this process. And uh, another reminder here about that, um, in addition to the CSS customizations not coming over, if you uploaded a logo or a header image or a homepage image in your OJS2 journal, that won't transfer over either. Um, those will have to be re-uploaded and recreated or recreated. I have put a link on this slide um, to a um, a guide from PKP that has lots of additional information about theming, um, especially useful for those interested doing advanced theming for your journal. Finally, in regards to the, the website's design, lack of responsiveness um, or the ability of the journal's web pages to adjust to the screen size was a major issue for OJS2, but uh, OJS3 is fully responsive and it adjusts beautifully to different screen sizes, whether you're looking at it on a phone, a tablet, or a desktop computer. So that's a big win with OJS3 as well. Okay, we're going to move into next um, talking about how these upgrades are going to go. This will be a pretty high level overview of our process and what you should expect. And as I've indicated, we'll be upgrading 75 individual journals and we want to be able to provide space and support for each journal team to get its, its journal prepared for this change. As a result, we're doing a staged process, working institution by institution in collaboration with our library contacts at each, um, at each university. When we begin the upgrade process for any given institution, I'll send an email out to all the journal teams and library contacts giving you a heads up that we're about to begin. And after that, we'll begin working with each individual journal at that institution. And that's the process I'm going to talk about now. This is a busy slide, so you don't need to try to read everything that's on here because I'm going to break it down uh, step by step over the next few. But I want you to note here a couple of things. One, that TDL will be creating new journal sites in OJS3 that will be running in parallel to your OJS2 site and then migrating your legacy content into the new site. This means you'll have a legacy OJS2 site represented by that orange column on the left and a staging OJS3 site, the blue column, that will be running in parallel until the end of the upgrade process. The legacy site will remain your live or production OJS journal until we make the final URL switch at the end of the process. And now I'm going to break it down with a little more detail. As I said before, before we begin any institutional upgrade, we'll send out a big email to all the journal teams from that institution giving you a heads up. And soon after that, each journal team will receive an invitation th through our help desk system to invite you to log in and explore your new OJS3 journal. 
that journal will have the same URL as your legacy journal, except it'll have hyphen stage added to the end. That journal at that point will be blank. None of your articles, issues, or users will have been brought over. And the help desk ticket that's created with that invitation will follow the journal through the upgrade and migration process. And if and when you have questions during that process, you can just reply to that email and we'll um, get that question and try to address it. The new OJS3 site will have no content at this point, as I said, but you can use this time to develop the necessary theme elements for your new site, such as a logo and homepage images, any customized style sheets that you want to um, upload, and any changes to the header color, anything like that that you want to do. You should take note of any theme changes that you decide on and save all those images you create for the theme just in case um, some of that gets lost in the next stage, the migration stage. When your team is ready to proceed to the next step, you will reply to the help desk ticket to request migration. And then our system administrator will schedule a date on which we'll do the migration and he'll let you know. So, I just want to emphasize here that once we invite you into your staging site to test and uh, theme and play around, you have as much time as you need at that point to get ready. And it will be up to each journal team to then let us know when they're ready to proceed to the next and final step of the upgrade. On the scheduled date, our system administrator, Nick Lowland, will migrate all the articles, issue data, user data, etc., to the new journal site. Once this process begins, your legacy OJS2 site will become read-only. Users will be able to come to the site and read articles, download articles, uh, navigate through the site, but they won't be able to submit manuscripts, do reviews, or perform editing tasks. So as a result of that, we want to keep this period of the process as short as possible, hopefully to one week or less. Once the migration is complete, you'll be notified. That migration will take about a, a, couple, a few hours. You'll be notified and then you should test the site thoroughly and make sure everything made it over and is working properly. You can notify TDL of any issues you encounter via the help desk ticket, and if there aren't any open issues after a week, we'll switch the DNS so that your real URL points to the new OJS3 site rather than the legacy site. So that hyphen stage will come off the URL in effect. We'll keep the legacy site around for a while after this just in case, but it will no longer be the production site and all new work should happen in the OJS3 site at that point. And that's it. <laughs> Here are some things to consider as you get ready for this process. <clears throat> You'll need to think about the look of your site. It won't look the same in OJS3, and you'll be responsible for updating it prior to migration. Secondly, you will have as much time as you need to plan for migration into your, within your staging journal. You will notify us when you're ready for the final migration stage. Finally, when thinking about scheduling the migration, we want you to keep a couple of things in mind. First, remember that your site will be read-only for some period of time. Take that into account and plan accordingly. You won't want to schedule that week-long period during a time when you really need people to be working in the journal. Second, set aside time during that week to test and implement any changes. Um, be ready to test so that you can, uh, so that we can move quickly to uh, 
get the process finished and remove those read-only restrictions from the site. Here is a general schedule of upgrades by institutions. So I mentioned that U of H and Texas State are up first, followed by Texas A&M uh, sponsored journals. And then the remainder of the institutions are grouped in um, to four additional cohorts. We haven't put dates or months on these yet because while we plan to work on U of H and Texas State in September and then start A&M in October, it's my hope that we'll be able to accelerate the pace of this process as we get further into it. Um, and so I don't want to set um, any dates in concrete for institutions beyond the first two. You'll know that we're starting the process for your institution because you'll get an email from me letting you know and we'll begin notifying individual journal managers that their staging site is ready. But no matter when your institution is listed in the upgrade schedule, you can begin preparing for the upgrade now. We have a demo OJS3 site available for you to test, learn, and explore in and begin making preparations so that you're ready to go when the time comes. We can even create a separate journal in this site for you so that you can just go crazy with it. To get login credentials for this site, you just email the TDL help desk at support at tdl.org and provide your name, institution, and email address and we'll get a user account set up with the correct permissions. And please note that as a non-production site, we only keep this demo OJS3 site running during business hours between 7.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. Central Time. If that is a, a real imposition for you, um, please let us know through the help desk and we'll um, see what we can do about accommodating some, some off hours availability of the site. Okay, we're heading into the home stretch here. So please begin entering any questions you have into the chat window and I'm gonna talk to you about a few resources um, that we have available for you in addition to the demo site. This slide includes links to TDL's resources in our wiki um, to, uh, that are about the upgrade process that I just shared with you and about OJS3 generally. That journal upgrade resources page in particular I want to highlight includes a testing checklist for your journal team to use to make sure that everything's working properly. Okay. There's also a wealth of information about the OJS3 platform provided by PKP and I really encourage you to take advantage of these. Um, PKP has extensive documentation, it has video tutorials and user guides, and maintains a very active community forum where you can ask questions and get help from OJS3 users. Um, it's good to know about these resources now as you're learning about OJS3, but it will be good to bookmark these for future reference as well. And finally, the TDL Help Desk is available to you if and when you have questions at any time in this process. You can reach out um, to our support staff via email, web form, or at our toll-free number. We staff this help desk during business hours and um, try to get back to you uh, at minimum within one business day. Except where otherwise noted, um, this presentation is licensed under a, a CC BY license and can be shared and remixed with attribution to TDL and where appropriate to PKP because as I mentioned, this presentation is heavily indebted to documentation that they developed. And that concludes the prepared content for this um, webinar, but we have lots of time left for questions, and I see that there are some um, coming into the chat window here. So I'm going to take a look. Okay. In upgrade three, 
will we be able to have statistics of how many readers access the journal, how many downloads, etc. Um, yes, there are reports that are available in OJS3. I don't have the um, detailed list in front of me, but um, there are counter statistics, there are um, uh, other usage statistics about downloads. I don't know if individual readers um, is counted. I would have to get back to you on that. Um, there is also, as there is an OJS2, an, a Google Analytics um, plugin integration that you can use to access Google Analytics tracking of your site and those usage statistics. Um, another question, now that customization will be easier, can we create a document guiding customization limits under TDL policy? Uh, I, that's a good idea. I mean, I think that um, as far as we're concerned, the limits include what is, what is possible through the user interface, right? So the, the limits to customization are um, what can be done through the user interface, through plugins, etc., uh, authorized plugins. Um, because we host as many journals as we do, we can't allow code customizations, for instance. Um, but I agree, I agree with you that um, better documentation in our wiki about what those customization options are would be helpful, and um, we can certainly work on that. I appreciate that question. Shireen asks, will we need to create a note slash link in our journal site to direct users to the new site since we won't have back access once it becomes legacy? Okay, good question. So, no. Um, when we move to the new site, it's going to have the same URL as your old site. So, there won't be any need to update um, or redirect users to the new site. They will go, when they go to your same URL, it'll just go automatically to the new site once we get to the end of the process. I hope that answers the question. What I would say is that um, when we're in that process of migrating content, um, where we have the one week period of read only access, it might be useful for you to put a message on your legacy site at that point that alerts readers to the fact that they won't be able to submit new manuscripts um, because the site is read-only at that point. But that period of time should be pretty brief. But once the migration is done and we've switched the URL over to the new site, it should be a completely seamless experience for your readers and users. They won't need to be redirected to the new site. Um, okay, Shireen asks, will we be able to receive undeliverable email notifications when internally sent emails get returned? The majority of our emails sent from the system are not received by our users. Okay, so the email issues are ones that we've seen ongoing. Um, emails sent out from the system often get flagged by spam filters at various institutions. Um, there are some things that we've tried to do to limit that from happening but there's a limited amount we can do. Um, 
and it's highly dependent on the spam filtering rules that any institution um, has that's receiving those emails. So we will continue to work on that, but I would not expect this upgrade itself to change that problem, unfortunately. Okay. Um, okay. I hope I'm catching these. Leah, you can help me if I'm not, um, if I'm skipping any questions. Uh, do we need to make sure we do not have any articles in the review edit stage before um, migration, or will those be able to be transferred over in the stage they are in? Okay, good question. You, you can have articles in any stage of the editorial process when the migration happens. They should just move over in whatever stage they're in, and they'll appear in the new journal in that stage. But you don't, once we start migrating and we have content in two different places, you aren't going to want to make any changes um, during that period because then those changes will not have been migrated over into the new journal, if that makes sense. So, um, so yeah, it, it doesn't matter if there's content that's kind of midstream. You just don't want to make any changes during the migration period during that one week migration period when we have content in two places. Yep. Okay. These are great questions. Are there others and have I missed any? Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry, Lynn. AFA asked about advertising. Is the question about whether we'll allow advertising? Or whether that's supported by the system? Limits for customization. Ah, I see. So um, we don't have any policy rules about advertising. So it, our only, our real um, strong policy rule is that, you know, the journal has to be open access and advertising is not, doesn't preclude open access. Um, in terms of customizing the site to accommodate advertising, um, like Google Ads or something like that, um, if it can be done through CSS customization, then, um, then I think that's fine. If it cannot, then we can't, we can't change the underlying code of the, um, of the application to accommodate it. But it may be that it's worth having a, a sidebar conversation about it to, to hear more about what you're thinking and, and what the, um, the limits you're up against. So I would suggest uh, sending in a, a help desk ticket about this question um, and um, we can set up a phone call, I think, to, to talk more about it with our system administrator. Lynn, thank you for highlighting that. I missed it entirely. Yeah, I agree, um, AFA. I think that, um, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> You're doing great. Um, 
I agree that that some clear expectations around theming are 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 needed. Um, it is, I mean, from our perspective, um, the limits are are clear, but I can see where they are not for users sometimes. So we need to do a better job about documenting that and communicating it. I think that my understanding uh, about the need for customization for um, to allow advertising is probably limited at this point, so I think that's where we need to have more conversation so that I can understand a little better. Um, and I would also say that uh, customization is something that we could in, and should enlist library partners in um, to see what kind of capacity they might have to support CSS customization. Um, to accommodate some of those requests. Tamu Libraries asks if there would be interest in a TDL OJS user group. Well, that AM Libraries, thank you for asking that question. I think that is a question for the group on the phone um, as much as anything. This is something we have been exploring and have been hearing and intuiting some need for. And so we're looking at the best ways to go about this, um, whether it's an OJS specific user group, whether it is a um, more of a publishing user group. Um, but uh, I'm really interested to get a sense from folks whether it's something that would be useful. That looks like a lot of positive uh, responses. <laughs> yeah. B press inclusion, welcome. I, I think that's a good idea to expand it beyond um, just OJS users because we have a lot of. Um, library published or library supported journals within our community that aren't in OJS necessarily. Um, so we'll, we will take that under advisement and ANM libraries will be coming at you to um, see if you're interested in helping lead such a group. That would be, that would be awesome. Um, so I think I would say expect to hear more on that this fall. Uh, that's definitely on our agenda to get something going. And I would also encourage everybody to, uh, again, I mentioned this before, but take advantage of the PKP communities that exist as well um, and the, the forums that exist there because there is a lot of support through that, whether it's technical support or, or just kind of publishing support. Justin says it could be coupled with OER publishing, which is an interesting idea as well. Yeah, a lot of... Um, We've got press books going for, for textbook publishing. Um, and so there's a lot of potential crossover there. Okay, we still have a few minutes left. Are there any additional questions or comments? Okay, well, um, As I've said, please do let us know um, when those questions come up. You will be hearing from us over the next weeks um, and months as we move through this process. We will be, um, we have recorded this webinar. We'll be captioning it and putting it up online for you to refer to or to share with whoever um, might need it. And, um, and we want you to uh, let us know when you're having issues, when you're having questions, so that we can make sure this process goes as smoothly as possible for everybody. We're excited about it, and we will uh, be in touch very soon. Thanks for joining today, everybody. <laughs>